And, and when we were trying to explain we're doing this for, for charity and we're trying to raise um, awareness that the dementia is in every corner of the world, the, the answer that came back was they don't know what dementia is. And, and to, to us, we wanted to say, oh, this is the perfect reason to, to go and highlight this the, because they did know what the symptom was, were, but they didn't know actually that it was a, an illness and that there was potentially a way for a cure. And because, you know, their medical supplies, especially in, in that part of the world, is so, so low. There's no doctors or hospital or anything like that. So that was the probably the scepticism on their side, which is totally understandable. And it's something I've, I've realized more and more is I am simply a visitor. I'm simply a guest when I go to these places. And, and that's why it was so important we got that approval because we didn't want to just rock up without any permission. We wanted full permission from anyone. And in the end, it was probably one of the most positive days of my life. In this podcast, I'm going to be exploring what it takes to live a life full of adventure and freedom. I'll be interviewing adventurers, explorers, and business owners who have set their life up to have an abundance of choice. And I'm also going to give you the high performance tips and tricks I teach my adventurepreneur clients to have the kind of life they want and be the type of person they wish they were. So if you're not already, subscribe to the show and settle in for another episode of The Freedom Project. Louis Alexander is one of the UK's most promising and exciting adventurers. Spurred on by his grandfather's battle with dementia, Louis is taking on a series of challenges to help raise awareness and funding to help the UK government improve what is offered to dementia patients. In today's podcast, we discuss Louis' seven marathon challenge. In today's podcast, we discuss Louis' seven marathon challenge and his origins of adventure. The seven marathon challenge was his mission to run a marathon in each of the world's continents. And this journey was littered with both trials and lessons, the learnings of which Louis is going to pass on to you in this podcast episode. Louis has also just released the details of his next, in my opinion, even more epic adventure, where he will swim a marathon in each of the seven seas. So here's the wonderful Louis Alexander. Welcome to the show, Louis. Um, such a pleasure to be speaking to you. Thank you, Tom. I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk to you. Hey, so we we were talking about um, purpose just before we started recording, mm. before we pressed that big red button. And it's always interesting to me how people come to find their purpose um, because mm. some people spend or seemingly spend their whole life seeking it so desperately and other mm. people um, just, it clicks very, very, mm. very uh, like there's, a, there's an early, early switch or an early kind of Geiger meter where you're like, oh, there's something mm. around this direction. When did it start to appear to you that um, that this is something that I really want to do? Like this is the direction I want to take my life in. Purpose, you're right. It's such a powerful word, and it's a difficult word because everyone has many different opinions on it and things like that. Um, my purpose was in many ways handed to me when I was 19, when everything changed for me. Um, I was never necessarily an adventurous kid. I was a sporty kid, but I was never adventurous. But when I was 19, I found out it was my grandfather's dream to climb a mountain in Africa called Mount Kilimanjaro. And sadly, he was diagnosed with dementia when he was very young and in his late 50s. So he never had the opportunity to do so. And, and for reference, my grandfather, he was Captain Rick Taylor. He served in the British Army for 38 years. He served all around the world, but it was his uh, fight against dementia which ended his life. And when I was 19, I decided to go out to Africa and climb for him and climb in his honour. And although I went out there for him and to raise money for a charity called Alzheimer's Research UK, who I've supported for five or six years now, it's safe to say I returned home with something for myself too. And, and that was this purpose. So in many ways, I owe my purpose. I owe my love for adventure and everything that comes with it. I owe that to my grandfather. He very much gave me my purpose. Okay. So what was your granddad like? Tell me about him. Well, the, the truth is the granddad I know is through the stories that I've been told about him because he was diagnosed when I was only two years old. So my direct memories, my first hand memories of him are granddad forgetting how to how to, to drive, forgetting how to use a knife and fork, forgetting who I was, forgetting who my mum was, and then eventually, you know, forgetting who him, he was himself. That's unfortunately the memories I have. So instead I've decided to try and push that away as much as possible and and remember him as the the stories I've been told. The, the man who was a uh, a man who, like yourself, served our country. A man who was who dedicated his life to his family. A man who was a, a skier, a climber, an abseiler. All these incredible things. Uh, he was very much an adventurer and explorer in his own right. It's always interesting how I I don't know whether you hear this frequently when when you talk about this, but mm. out of almost all the conversations I have 
it's very rarely parents that inspire us to do things, but it's quite often grandparents. And I'm not sure mm. why that is. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but there seems to be something like more important or like there's some, not necessarily more important, but something that really truthful that seems to emanate from grandparents. Mm. It's interesting. It's interesting. I'm not sure the answer to that either. I wish I'd, I had a good answer for that, but it's true. I've seen that a lot with people. And maybe it's because we spend a little bit less time. Most people do spend a little bit less time with their grandparents. So you don't know them just as well, but you, you have these special moments with them. I'm not sure what it is, but although my parents didn't necessarily give me that purpose of adventure, they definitely supported it and, and have been, you know, my biggest believers from day one. So they were the, the ones who, when I was 22, just over two years ago, they would want to encourage me to go full time. So I do owe it to, to them too. I, truthfully, I owe everything that's happened in the last few years to, to those around me. That's the truth. What were the kind of stories that were told about your grandfather? What were the stories? The, there's many stories. He, he and the, the more I've been getting into adventure and these things, the more I've been told stories of how potentially I resemble him and, and how our stories have kind of lined up in some ways. Like he very much used to take on challenges for charity too. And he used to abseil off buildings to raise money for this charity and different things like that. So I've heard a lot of wonderful stories in that sense. But he was someone who he... he I think he joined the army when he was 15, 16 or something like that. He very much worked all the way up from private to captain. He was he was just a man of man probably of purpose, as we spoke about before, a man of dedication, a man of man of good things, shall we say. That's the truth. So when did you start working for the benefit of a cure for dementia? So when I climbed Kilimanjaro when I was 19 and then, so I think we raised maybe 5,000 with that first challenge. And that's when I, I sort of returned home with this brand new found passion for adventure, but also a realization that actually these challenges can maybe use as a platform for, for this cause. And at the time when I did Kilimanjaro, my granddad was very much in his last moments. Uh, he was, he was at a care home. He was, he hadn't walked or, or, or talked for, for many years. And sadly, I think about three months after I returned home, he did pass away. And I had one of the, what I like to perceive as one of the greatest privileges where my nan asked me to deliver the eulogy at his funeral. And you get 19 years old, still working out my purpose, really. And, and the truth is, at that funeral, I didn't know what to say. That, that's the honest truth, Tom, because what do you say when your granddad, who you don't really know, in, you know directly that well, but you, you admire him as one of your heroes because of the stories you've been told about him, what do you say at his funeral when he's lost the last 17 years of his life to, to one of the most devastating illnesses? I didn't know what to say. That's the truth. Um, so instead, I just stood up there and I made a promise. And that was a promise to support this fight against dementia until the day we find a cure. And at the time, I definitely thought that might be one thing a year, one challenge while I crack on with life, whatever that might be. But in the end, about after about three years of of, of trying to work things out from about 19 till 22, trying different jobs across different careers, different industries. In the end, uh, I decided to go full-time at 22 and, and dedicate my life to, to adventure, which is something I love, but also this opportunity to use these challenges as platforms for, for something bigger than myself, because the truth is I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I can't find a cure that way. I'd love to, but I can't. But what I can do is I can use these challenges to hopefully raise that money, raise that awareness, which is equally as important and uh, hopefully have an impact that way. So that's a pretty unconventional career path to take to go, well, I, I could do all these things and kind of have part-time adventurist uh, or mm. adventurer kind of um, pursuit, but to to go, well, I'm going to make this my thing. And this is mm. what a large part of my life is like, don't get me wrong. I think it's a, a brilliant thing to do and for a wonderful cause. And, and definitely if there's any time in your life to do it, it's starting mm. in your early twenties and like a hundred percent, like you might as well, send it down that path because it's it's something that's inherently meaningful to you and it'll, you'll learn so much from it but like mm. how do you come to a decision like that where you where you think well i'm gonna go full time into this and i'm not gonna not gonna uh, pursue a current uh, a conventional career well you're right it is it is an unconventional career and actually i was doing a talk yesterday and one of the kids asked have you ever had a proper job and it was such a great question and everyone laughed and I laughed too because it, it's so true. Um, but the truth is it wasn't an overnight decision. It was three years. 
And from 19 till 22, I, the plan wasn't to, to become a full-time adventurer. I didn't even know really you could make this a full-time career. Obviously, now I've learned through sponsorship, through talks, and, and God willing, one day I can get into book writing and TV, like, you know, the likes of Steve Backshaw and Beg Reels, you know, that's the, the plan. But the truth is from 19 and 22, I, I did try loads of different things and I failed across all of them. And it was three years of, in many ways, failure. Not failure because I was getting fired, but failure because... I just didn't love them. They weren't fulfilling that purpose of mine. And for me, that I, I knew there was something bigger than than doing something up just to, you know, just to to fill my time and get by and work for the weekends. You know, I knew that was never me. But the truth is I didn't know what that purpose was. But behind the scenes, without realizing, the only thing I did have going for me at the time was these adventures were building and building. And I got into ultra marathons and I did a challenge a challenge on Tenny Fan, which I'm, I'm sure you've spent a, a lot of time on Penny Fan. And I did lots of little things like that. And I was learning how to raise more money for charity. I was learning how to find little bits of press and how to find sponsorship so we could cover the, the cost of the, the, the expeditions without having to use any of the charity money because I never use any charity money. They're totally separate. So without realizing, I was starting to, to build this skill set because being an adventurer or an explorer, whatever you want to call it, it's not just about the challenges. You know, 90% of the work is behind the scenes. So without realizing, I was building this skill set and and then it came to, I think, November, well, I remember the exact date, 16th of November, 2021, I sort of just had a bit of a crossroad. I realized, okay, I think I'd just left the most recent job. And I thought, there's only one thing in life I love, and it's these adventures. And I was like, okay, I can either go down a more traditional route as, as you know, my school was pushing, or lots of my friends were, were going down, which is absolutely fine. Or, and, and I can enjoy my adventures on the weekend, or can I go for this full time? Can I make this my life, my career? And as mentioned earlier, my parents, they're, they're amazing. And they said those exact words. If you're ever going to do this, do it now. You've got no kids, no mortgage. No, just go for it. Just go for it and try. And my parents themselves, they are risk takers. They've, they've had highs and lows and more than anyone. And, and they understand the, the power of risk and taking that leap on yourself sometimes. And I went for it. And I knew to do to go full time, I had to do uh, actually, that day, the 16th of November, I made my first website. I put it out there. Uh, I just I just went for it. And, and I said, right, uh, to do this properly, I need to have a big challenge, which is going to do two things. It's going to, first of all, launch this new career. I didn't know what this career looked like. But also, I needed to do something which was going to honor my grandfather because he was the reason I first found Adventure. And that's when I decided to run those 17 marathons in 17 consecutive days in honor of the 17 years he lived with the illness. And that challenge changed everything everything that was the toughest initiation in my mind for me at the time at least at 22 for this career because I learned how to do I learned how to deal with the great adversity I had dealt with at the time but also how to do everything behind the scenes it was very very challenging and tough and it's also where I met my sponsors who who have carried me you know these last two years yeah it's it's, it's fascinating because actually before we get to that it takes an enormous amount of courage mm. to go I'm going to do what I think is right for me and not mm. follow the herd, for want of a better term, not to, mm. not do what's expected by your friends, and not to do what's expected by society. But go, this is what's right for me. Like, why didn't you do what everyone else was doing? It's a tough question. It's yeah, it's that that fear of, of failure, isn't it? It's so powerful, and I, I see it so much in my generation. But the truth is, those three years where I was just trying, I think I maybe maybe tried a dozen different jobs and, and oh, careers and different jobs. paths. What, what did you try? Most random of things, right? Everything, you know, I, I'd worked in a, in, a, in a gym, on a golf course, uh, as a gardener, just, just most of the random things, just tried everything. Um, I really did. And they just weren't for me. But in that three years, I built up this like, almost this resilience that I didn't mind failing. I didn't, I, I really didn't mind. I, I learned actually that actually it was quite powerful. And actually it, when I was looking at other people around me, I realized, hang on, that it, it crushes many people when they do fail. But for me, for some reason, it's, it's, it, uh, there's this sort of resistance. And, and also at some point I started to thrive on it. Like I'll try and different things and moving on. It was really strange. And actually in many ways back then I, I feared failure less than I do now. It's quite, it's quite interesting because it was almost at the time I had nothing to lose. And, and I guess that's probably the answer. But I don't know why. I think I just had wonderful parents and people around me who just encouraged me to do something that I already wanted to do. And, and that made it 10 times easier. But in terms of why I didn't 
just follow the herd. I, I don't know the exact answer. Maybe there's something that will come to me in the next few years as I grow up. But that's the truth. I'm, I'm still working out very much for myself. Yeah, of course. And you always will be. Always will be. Mm. There's so many places I want to take this conversation because I, I just find it fascinating how, you, how you've done this. And it's a really interesting path to go down. One no, of the things you. is, how do you make this into like a day-to-day habit? Because once you said, like you mm. said, well, I'm going to make this, this leap there's obvious things like okay well i'll set up an instagram page and i'll start posting that or i'll, I'll set up linkedin yeah. and a website and start talking about things but like right. then what like how what what does that actually look like in terms of making this into a career well there's no blueprint there's no blueprint and there's no right way or maybe there's no wrong way either of, of doing it and uh, i mean I, I had all these heroes who who i look up to and i uh, i still do look up to the likes of as I mentioned, Bear Grylls, Steve Backshaw, Lewis Pugh, Nick Butter, Jordan Wiley, and I looked at how they built these incredible careers. And yes, many of them had, had gone into uh, into it after a different career, whether it was in the military or something else. But I just thought there might be an opportunity where I could go for a young age, and maybe that could be my, you know, my USB. And I realized, you know, to, to write and to do this, uh, these talking things, maybe, you know, I need a few more years, you know, I needed to learn first myself who I was and what I could potentially share to this world. Um, still, in some ways today, I don't think I have enough to share to the world, but I've been very fortunate where people believe I do. But the answer was sponsorship. Uh, that was the truth. And that's what I knew I needed from day one. How does that work? Again, there's no right way of doing it. And for me, it meant knocking on a thousand doors. So when I decided to do the 17 marathon, 17 days, I knew again, I didn't want to use any of the charity money to, to fund the, the cost of the trip. And for those 17 days, we were we were traveling all around the UK. We were trying to highlight where all the research labs are for the charity. So we need money to, you know, for the fuel, for the food, for everything like that, for accommodation. And I ended up knocking on a thousand doors. And the power of social media is an amazing thing. The power of LinkedIn for example, but sending cold messages, cold emails and things like that. And somehow those few words I put together uh, got picked up by, I think, maybe maybe seven or eight different sponsors. You know, so that's a, that's a low success rate when you compare it to the amount of, you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even a thousand messages I had sent. But those people believed in it for some reason. And credit to them, my main sponsor, Thomas Franks, who I met met that day, They've supported me now for over two years and I'm now on a full-time contract with them. So as, as some people may have seen on my most recent project, I, I wear their logo, you know, sort of Formula One type sponsorship. But my greatest value, which I like to think is I now go into into their offices and to their clients and I give talks and I share some of the, the lessons and and the stories from these adventures. Because as you know, there, there's always lessons on these adventures and uh, these lessons can hopefully be transferred into all worlds, you know, whatever your background may be and whatever your job may be, because the power of sport, the power of adventure, it's pretty incredible. Is it fair to say your greatest adventure so far has been the the seven marathons in each continent? I think so. Yeah. What do you learn from, actually, before we get to that, what kind of logistical things do you have to set up to, to establish a, a, a challenge like that? For the, the, the seven continents. Yeah. So logistically, that was without doubt the hardest thing I've ever done because the truth is that I was 23 for most of the project. The tr- truth is I'd never visited the... In the end, I, I ran through two deserts, Alaska, the outback, the Amazon rainforest, the Arctic, and Antarctica. And out of those seven places, I'd never been to any of them. <laughs> so not only was I going to them for the first time, but I was also going there to deliver this expedition, deli- you know, uh, complete this marathon, hopefully conclude, uh, take on some press to raise money in, in these countries as well and uh, awareness. So logistically, it was without doubt the toughest thing I've ever done. And again, it came down to the power of email, the power of, of cold messaging someone. And, you know, I always knew I wanted to work with locals. No one in my mind knows the land or the wildlife or the risks better than the locals. So I knew I wanted to work with them as much as possible. And that came down to sending these cold emails and explaining who I was. And I've got some funny stories of, of how I met a few other people, like with the, the guys in the outback. You know, I, I found the, the, I think it was called like the Lord Mayor of this outback town. I found his email and, and he told me there was only one guy in the town who ran marathons, gave me his email. And it happened like that, you know, for the Amazon, for example, that took, I was running on the indigenous land of the Quechua community, and that took three months of negotiations and back and forth to get their permission. So logistically, it was very, very tough. 
Okay. Talk to me about the Amazon start there. Like what's, what's that experience like for you? The Amazon was incredible. And I think when I reflect on the, the challenges and some of these lessons I've returned home with, I think often it's getting to that start line, as we all talk about, is often so, so often the hardest. And the Amazon, for example, it was three flights, a 100 kilometer boat journey, and I think two canoes just to get to the start line. Mm-hmm. So straight away, you know, you put in the perfect preparation, all the training, you know, 10 hours of training, 10 hours of recovery. And that's why it's so important. Because when you get to that start line, you're already fatigued, you know, you're already tired, you've maybe not slept, you're jet lagged, and then you've got to go out there and deliver. And often with these marathons, I only had one opportunity because I didn't necessarily have the time or the sponsorship to go back and try it again. I always knew at the end of this project, I wanted to deliver my letter to 10 Downing Street. So I had to make that, you know, almost that time deadline. You carried it the whole way around, didn't you? I, I carried it through the final three. Okay. So nice. really I, I, I done four and then I launched the, the letter on World Alzheimer's Day with three to go. But the truth is, and I won't lie to you, it wasn't the same letter for all three final marathons because again, tatty. I've made many mistakes on this on this project that Amazon's one got absolutely destroyed. In it. And there's a video actually of me pulling it out after and you can't even unfold it because it, it molded together because we've been hit with a rainstorm. And I learned my lesson there that, you know, I should have laminated it or covered it some way or protected it. Um, but it, it was really tough. But yeah, getting to that start line is so, so tough. But the Amazon was incredible. We ran on this indigenous land of the, this Quechua community, about 250 people. They didn't know what a marathon was. They, they didn't even really know what running was as a form of exercise, which is so interesting, you know, to me because we come from, you know, you know, our country, you know, we, we, all, everyone talks about training and the gym and things like that, but because their daily routine is all about being active, it's about working on their land, it's about, you know, anywhere they need to go, they might need to walk or canoe themselves, it's all these different things, is that training and exercise isn't part of their, their daily routine, you know, their, their daily routine is to survive, and for them, that means working and, and physically moving all the time, so when they saw some 95 kilo ginger kid rock up and want to run on their land they didn't understand what i was doing yeah who and, are you and emailing we... with to to get that permission <laughs> as well so that one was someone in the capital of ecuador in quito um we got him to speak on our behalf okay. to the indigenous people because they wouldn't speak directly to us so there's two types of communities in the amazon there's uh there's the contacted tribes and there's the uncontacted tribes so we were going through a contacted tribe. So often in, in these contacted tribes, maybe the leaders or the elders often, which is uh, a couple of the men in the community have access to a phone because they may work in some form of tourism or, or in, the, in the construction or industry. There may be something like that where they, they have access to a phone. And in this sense, I think it was someone in Quito, it was his third or fourth cousin or something like that who still lived in the tribe. And... Uh, we uh, went back for three three months of negotiations because there was one elder who wouldn't get a, give approval, and it took ages going back and forth on WhatsApp and emails to, to what get was that the concern? final approval. The concern they just didn't know who we were or what we were trying to do. That was probably it. it. They, they 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 didn't. And when we were trying to explain we're doing this for for charity and we're trying to raise um, awareness that the dementia is in every corner of the world, the, the answer that came back was they don't know what dementia is. And, That's and interesting. To, to us, we wanted to say, oh, this is the perfect reason to, to go and highlight this the, because they did know what the symptom was, were, but they didn't know actually that it was a, an illness and that there was potentially a way for a cure. And because, you know, their medical supplies, especially in, in that part of the world, is so, so low. There's no doctors or hospital or anything like that. So that was the probably the skepticism on their side, which is totally understandable. And it's something I've, I realized more and more is I am simply a, a visitor. I'm simply a guest when I go to these places. And that's why it was so important we got that approval because we didn't want to just rock up without any permission. We wanted full permission from anyone. And in the end, it was probably one of the most positive days of my life where everyone, as we were running down the, the track, like they had this one path in the community, which they'd sort of chopped down and made. And that was what people could use to get to their boats or the kids could walk to their little nursery. And we were just running up and down that and people were just cheering with us smiling with us one of the elders wives she ran like 14 kilometers with us and she'd never ran before mm-hmm. like it was just incredible so positive and we didn't speak each other's language you know I, I can speak spanish but not an indigenous type of spanish they can't speak english you know they didn't even understand fully like um hand gestures or things like that like thumbs up and high fives they didn't really understand that too well 
So it was just the literally the, the power of a smile and adventure and it just worked and somehow brought us together. And obviously we, we had a translator too, which was uh, incredible. That must have been an incredible experience. <laughs> Not only the, the obviously, obviously the marathon, but meeting people who have a very different reality to you. Mm. How did you decide on that location? Because I'm guessing you can't go into Strava and go, okay, well, I'm going to find <laughs> me a, a 26.2 mile route to here. Yeah, you're, you're right. The, the, I think five, so five out of seven of the, the continents were self-organized. And for me, that was when I first heard about this project to run a marathon all seven continents, it's called the, it's called the Seven Continents Marathon Club. And some people say it's like the pinnacle of adventure running. Um, and when I looked into what people had done, you know, some people had ran it in seven days, which is incredible. There's some people who have done it um, often running like near the, the more traditional marathon routes, like the Singapore Marathon, the Berlin Marathon. Again, amazing, but that's just not not my sort of focus. Instead, I want to try and run in some of the more remote places and do something a little bit different, which was hopefully going to help push that awareness with the, the press and raising the money for the charity. So for me, it came down to what do I perceive as potentially the harshest marathon in each place and for me when I thought about South America it had to be the Amazon and the reason I picked Ecuador was because they speak Spanish rather than Portuguese like Brazil or somewhere and then it just came down to finding someone in the capital you know again sending us several emails someone got back said oh we know someone did it and just going back and forth until we found a potential route but it took ages because there was no original route until we found this community who had this sort of I think it was like a seven kilometer path uh, apart from that, obviously, you'd have to be hacking down trees and things like that. You know, logistically and safety-wise, probably wouldn't have been the best. Just a quick favour to ask. If you love the show and you think it may help someone else in the world, then head to wherever you listen to The Freedom Project and leave a five-star review and maybe even share it with some friends. It really does help me and it helps the show too. I can continue to get fantastic guests on the show. It reaches more people and it makes me feel great too. So I would be enormously grateful if you could leave a five-star review and share any episodes of the podcast that you love. What was the journey like to get to that village? What's that community? It's incredible. Incredible. And it's not what you expect, you know, taking that boat down the river you know, it doesn't just fly straight down. It, it does these zigzags the whole way because the water's always changing and the sand. And, and we got hit with a rainstorm on our first boat journey in. And, and that really sort of woke us up and made us realize actually how serious this is. We we're heading into somewhere where we were probably 10 hours away from the nearest hospital. And when we say hospital, you know, we mean a little shack with, with one guy with a bunch of, you know, medication and, and, and things like that. It's not a proper hospital. So that was a big realization when we got hit with that first rainstorm. And obviously that sort of foreshadows what was to come because actually on the day of the marathon at 18 kilometers, we got hit with a rainstorm too. And that lasted until about 38 kilometers. So a good half of the run was just an absolute downpour. And it's not rain like I've ever experienced before back home. It, it's, it's, it can just penetrate through everything, all the trees, everything, even though we were running underneath the canopy at some points, it was just absolutely covering through. The only benefit was it ended up flushing away lots of like the insects and some of the wildlife. So one of our big risks and one of our big decisions safety wise when we first got there was they advise you even when you're walking on a path to wear wellies because of snakes and things like that. And, and I realized because I had after returning home, I knew I had two weeks before the Arctic Marathon and I knew the risk of wearing wellies could cause some blisters or injuries and things like that. I, I made the decision maybe naively to wear trainers so I could actually run. So that and, and but actually the the rain helped because it ended up flushing away lots of the wildlife which, which sort of disappears when the rain comes out so maybe it was a blessing were you not just terrified for that first bit especially before it started raining where you're just like yeah i'm gonna tread on something because like for me I, I wouldn't be worried about the the physical aspects of it that much mm. like i think i could crack those marathons and like plus the jet lag yeah. things it's way more difficult and like, i get that but then the, <laughs> the creepy crawly thing is like that's a different yeah. era for me Hundred percent. I was terrified. Oh, for sure. And and these, you're right. These weren't marathons of running or, or challenges of running. These were challenges of survival. And for me, I was terrified. I was really terrified. Is it is it jaguars, right? Which yeah. are in the oh yeah, just drop down and, or in the yeah. Amazon, and, yeah. and they're very very. There's a, thing, a very small percentage in the Ecuadorian side of the jungle, but I was terrified of that as well. Uh, absolutely, I, I think fear is a, a really good thing to talk about because I think lots of adventurers and explorers may say they're fearless or stuff. No, I'm not fearless at all. I have a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. But I've 
trying to use that as sort of a focus to, to switch on. And the more I learn about it and the mindset company I work with called Gazing Red to Blue, they've taught me how to how to use it as an advantage and rather than push away fear or any emotions you feel towards it, which can often use more energy instead, embrace it, ask yourself, why am I feeling this fear in this sense, as you said, oh, well, I'm running through an Amazon covered in in snakes and various other wildlife, which could pose serious risks. Okay, that's understandable to feel fear. Okay, now let's use that to focus. Let's stay aware. Let's keep open communication with the support crew who were, who were on a canoe going up and down the river as we were running down the bank. And, you know, you use it to switch on. But I was terrified. But you know more than you know more than me when it comes to fear. What what's your thoughts on on fear with the various expeditions you've done in? You've said in exactly and right. Like there. you you don't like, and I I don't think my my knowledge is as expansive as many people's is, and they've been in the military. Um, but what I would say is that you were exactly right around not pushing it away. The mm-hmm. more you resist any kind of emotion, the more it doubles mm-hmm. down. I always say it's like a kid in mm-hmm. a swing. Like you push it away. And it comes back hard and yeah. you push it way harder. And then sure you get a respite, but it swings back harder. And it's, so you gotta okay. allow it to just be observer. Um mm-hmm. so that's the the kind of approach to fear, but like yeah, there's there's some things that kind of trigger fear a little bit more, I think. Um, and mm-hmm. it depends on your individual proclivity to it or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. What other moments stand out in terms of specific moments in each of these seven uh, marathons? What other moment in terms of in terms of fear or just in no, terms just of, generally when you think back to it, what ones come to mind? Well, the, I mean, or people often ask what was the hardest, and uh, I'd say the uh, the answer in that regard would be number one and seven. Mm-hmm. So number one, I started in the the desert of northern Africa, really hot, you know, forty degrees, incredibly humid. We were chased by a pack of wild dogs about fourteen kilometers in. So wildlife was a risk throughout this project and again in the outback i had an incident with a junkyard dog and the first thing i think of when i think of that whole project you know it was 14 months long the number one i think thing i think of is support crews because without my support teams during that project honestly i don't know where i would have been um and i i, I owe the success and the safety of each marathon to the people i had around me because in the desert of northern africa when i got chased by those dogs you know i, I didn't stand them down and face them off or fight them. No, I got saved by my support crew who who used the vehicle to the sound of the engine to scare them off. In the outback with the junkyard dog, you know, I had Grant, this marathon guy in the outback. He used his bike fearlessly and put it in between me and the dog to scare and started kicking the dog to scare it off. And without doubt, support crew is what made the whole project possible. And that that's the truth. But for me, the wildlife, the, the weather were definitely the highlights, the, the different climates, the different communities that it was contrast was the the great maybe one of the greatest words to describe the project because every marathon was so so different from the heat of the desert the humidity of the jungle the cold of the arctic and the antarctic i mean come on visiting antarctica at any point in your life let alone in your 20s has got to be one of the biggest privileges in the world you know yeah, um, pretty, beyond pretty grateful cool. for that opportunity oh, pretty cool one of the and we can skip this if you want and um, one thing that comes to mind is like how is it how expensive is it to, to do a challenge like this it's expensive you know we talk about the the i said i, I did five self-organized the other two I, I did organize one was in the wadi rum for asia so that was hosted by one of my friends and mentors nick butter but then we talk about number the other one was antarctica and that was because the only legal way to run a marathon in antarctica is this one race it's called the antarctic ice, ice marathon there's other ways you can run sort of on the, the borders of antarctica and on, on the sides but i wanted to run you know in the heart of antarctica do it properly and that race alone costs like twenty thousand. Mm-hmm. And so that's it's what, crazy flights logistics it's food it's accommodation it's everything it, like, i think the biggest part of that expense is the the safety aspect because they have to use satellites and radar guns to chop uh, to check the whole route for crevasses because of the greatest risk there is they actually want us to go out and run not to walk around constantly checking you know we actually want to go and run so in that sense, when we got there, I think two days before, they had to radar gun the whole route. They put all the flags out to say, well, this is where crevasses are. Don't go beyond this. Don't go too far here. And that's terrifying because you're running around and, and you know, you're, you're keeping an eye on these flags. And there was one point where the wind picked up and it, it picked up the snow and I couldn't see any of the flags and I just froze. But yeah, I think that's why the cost is so high. But, you know, it's so much money, so, so much money for, for one marathon, let alone the whole project. But when you you hope that the reward of the project is always greater than the cost. And for me, that was being able to honor my grandfather, but also 
return home and deliver this letter to 10 Downing Street to, to raise that awareness. So yeah. for me, it was worth it. Talk to you about delivering that letter. Delivering the letter was a special moment. When I, when I finished the, the marathon Antarctica, the truth is I felt nothing. There's something I'm interested to hear about your expeditions, what that, that feeling is you maybe you feel at the finish line. But for me, the whole project, the finish lines meant nothing. I didn't feel anything. And, and it was, I guess, both a good thing and a bad thing. But when, when we finished in Antarctica, there were people crying on the floor. There were people, you know, shouting out because it was their lifelong dream, you know, for 20, 30 plus years to, to do this. And it was incredible to see. But for me, I felt empty. I didn't feel anything because I knew I had to come home and deliver this letter. And actually that feeling, which I'd seen other people experience, was I felt that at number 10. When I knocked on that door, I knocked three times and it was like the death of the project in some ways. It was like my baby, something I'd been thinking about every single day for 14 months. It was over just like that with those three knocks. And it went, we were very lucky, me and my team, we were the only ones outside number 10 and they gave us about 15 minutes so we could do our filming and our photos and things like that and just just be trying to be present in the moment. And when I knocked on that door, it went dead silent and it was like the end of the project because I knew at that point I was handing over the, the letter to the Prime Minister's team. At that point, the decision was out of my control. It was now in the hands of, of our government to, to hopefully make that decision and, and uh, you know meet our sort of ask for the 16 million for dementia diagnostics because I've done everything I could at that point to to run around the world and raise this tension and go on to the TV shows and things like that. But ultimately it's them that have to hopefully agree. So it was a, it was a powerful moment, poignant moment in my own journey for sure. So what happens now with that that process of asking for the 16 million? So now, unfortunately we have to wait. So now we're, we're waiting to hear, I think it's been maybe five or six weeks. So some people said to wait about three months to hopefully hear back from them. And and of course I, I know the government have so many things they have to deal with, but I just hope that this can be up on their priority list because dementia is the biggest killer in the UK. One in four hospital beds are occupied by a dementia patient. So hmm. for me, it's, it's really important. And I know there's so many important things we need to fight for and shout about. And I agree with that. But yeah, the, the decision is very much now with the government. You know, that we're just waiting to hear, really. But whilst we're waiting, it doesn't mean we're sitting around doing anything. It, it, nothing. It means we're, we're now cracking on with plans for the next adventure, the next project to keep, you know, hitting this uh this baton and then keep raising this awareness because i'm not going to stop and uh, you know if i need to I'll, I'll dedicate my whole life to this fight that's that's no problem with me all i have to do is hope that the government maybe start to notice not just me but everyone who's fighting this fight because i represent a very very small you know part of this whole fight you know you've got all the carers the researchers the, those working at charities you've got all the amazing volunteers and fundraisers you know there's so so many of us so we just hope the government you know pays a little bit of attention this is probably a good time to ask what other people can do to draw awareness to this or to support your project or support this cause as a whole. Oh, that's very kind. Well, the the next project will be for Alzheimer's Research UK again. And uh, we may even do it again for dementia diagnostics because this is still such a big issue. And actually, it's just getting bigger and bigger. I saw a stat recently and it said 2% of people with dementia are um, diagnosed with a gold standard method which is devastating. Gold standard method means like a brain scan or a lumbar puncture. And as as I wrote in that letter a few months ago, you know, one in three people in England with dementia are never diagnosed. So that means that currently the the estimated figure is there's a million people with dementia in England. Um, What that means is probably actually one and a half million. And the problem is when we've got so many people undiagnosed, well, not only can they not officially get the care they need right now, it means when treatments do become available and we're hearing they could be one to two years away because we've had two drugs approved in America recently last year, which is amazing. And again, it doesn't fix all types of dementia, but it may have success rates with certain types of dementia. I think it might be frontotemporal dementia, one of the, the different types. And it's just the diagnosis, the cure, there's so many different things we've got to fight for. So if people are able to write to their local MP, if people are able to support those who are, who are fundraising and doing these things, you know, for my next challenge and all those doing amazing things, you know, there's lots of incredible things there's this great guy at the moment i'm not sure if you spoke to him called i think he's called jordan adams and he's uh him and his brother have sadly um been diagnosed with the dementia gene and they're in their 20s and there's a the high likelihood they'll develop dementia in their 40s and they're running the length of the uk in september and they're doing amazing things so getting behind these people you know it's, it's incredible and we're not asking for huge amounts but if people are able to, to give two minutes of their time to share something or five pounds of their hard-earned money 
you know, when we all come together, it adds up so, so quick. So there's, there's a lot we can all do. And I certainly can do more myself too. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 um, it's really inspiring. To, and I, I know you've probably heard that word so many times that it may have lost <laughs> some of its meaning, but it is truly inspiring to hear uh, the, the conviction that you have behind a cause like this. Um, I think there's, we all know the people who, <laughs> who run the London Marathon with under the guise of charity, whereas really it's just a selfish adventure. And I'm sure there's an element with you that's like you you enjoy the adventure, you should enjoy the challenge. But it seems like it's a perfect oh, okay. marriage of fifty percent and fifty percent, like to to really do something authentic with you. So it's it's really beautiful, to see, man. Well, that's that's very kind. It's definitely not lost. It's. Uh... It's power. I really do appreciate it. And it means a lot. And you're absolutely right. First of all, what my granddad gave me with that first adventure was the love for adventure. Without a doubt, I absolutely love what I do. And if you removed everything around these adventures and all I had was the ability to go out and do a challenge, I would still absolutely love them. But the ability to now use them as a platform too for something bigger than myself, it's like it's like a total win-win. Um, but you're right. I absolutely do love them. But I also love the impact they're potentially going to have one day. You know, we've been very lucky, I think, to raise over 50,000 now for, for the charity and, and hopefully a lot more in terms of awareness. Um, but we're going to keep keep going. That's the truth. But yeah, I absolutely love my adventures, of course. I bet. I bet. So take me back to the, the training for something like this. You mentioned the mental aspect of training, and I'm interested mm -hmm. by that. But let, let's go for a holistic view. Like, what do you have to do to prepare for something like this? So the, the training was, was so, so important for this project. And I had to change actually my goals with, with my training to, at the start of this project. So my goal no longer was to be the, the fastest that I could be or the fittest I could be or the strongest. It was about being as injury resistant as possible because I always knew that the big challenge with this project was, first of all, the lack of recovery and rest time sometimes in between them, but also the difference in, in conditions. So the hot, the cold, the humid, the actual terrain, you know, would be the snow or sand or ice that was one of the big big challenges so for me it was about being as injury resistant as possible because it didn't matter if i went there and ran a three-hour marathon or four-hour marathon all that mattered was i went out there i did the distance i hit the miles i raised this uh this uh this this letter at the end of the marathons and raised this where that was what was most important and i could come home and go on for the next one so for me it meant i had to be as injury resistant as possible so that meant for me matching every hour I put into training of my recovery. And uh, this is where it's, the, as we spoke about at the start, it's the greatest uh, benefit of being able to go all in and do this full time because it meant I was putting sometimes 20 hours of training and recovery in a week. And that's a huge amount. And those who are, who are working full time jobs and juggling other things, then having to do that, you know, it's so, so difficult. And I get that. And that's one of the greatest parts about having, you know, my sponsor, Thomas Franks, who believe in me because it allows me to dedicate this needed time. And uh, for me, that meant um, doing lots of things. I had a body lab, like high oxygen chamber, red light therapy, cryotherapy, all these scientific. Okay, talk sort of to me about. I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd with stuff like this. Talk to me oh, about yeah, like okay, processes and and how you approach that and kind of any protocols that you followed. So on on average, it would be say during a training week, it would be two or three times at the body lab doing a strength conditioning, red light therapy, cryotherapy, and then either a um, an hour in the hyperoxygen chamber or an hour in the float tank. Um, float tank has a little bit less physical benefits, but it's great for the mind. Mm -hmm. And when you're preparing for a challenge like that and you've got all the logistics going on, the all the, the commitments you know you have to put in at the laptop to get the project rolling, just that hour in the float. Have you tried a float tank? Yeah, it's also, uh, the, yeah. the birdie tells me that it's meant to be amazing if the psychedelics combined as well. <laughs> so it's, it's <laughs> going to be an incredible, I'm, I doubt that as preparation. Um, but so you, you'd spend, <laughs> yeah, probably not best of it. it depends. <laughs> so you'd spend an hour doing that. Um, and what was your experience of that? Yeah. Like? The, the float tank, I, yeah, I found it a real challenge at the start, you know, going from, you know, having all these ways people can access you and phone you and call you all the time and meetings and things suddenly to have an hour in this tank where uh, you, you're unreachable, but also, You've got no sound, no light, nothing, and you're just floating for an hour. It's it's a real challenge. Actually, it's a challenge of the mind, but it took me, I think, maybe four or five sessions to get into it, but but now I love it, and I try and do it once a week still. Um, so for me, on average, it was, yeah, two or three days at the body lab doing the S&C and the recovery, and then it was two or three days of running, because obviously the best way to, to be a good runner is to run. You know, the other stuff is just accessory work, as, as my coach says, but the foundation is actually getting those miles in. So an average run would have been probably around 15, 20 kilometers. So not, not huge amounts, not what people expect, but um, 
often then in the countdown to the challenge, say if we had a, a couple more weeks, I would do a rehearsal probably a week before the marathon. And that's when I, I would do it actually a full marathon and I'd wear all my kit that I was going to wear in the Amazon or the desert. I would practice all the food and the drink that I was going to take with me and I would go through everything. So I looked really silly. You know, I was running around Battersea Park, you know, you know, in this sort of desert kit and things. But hey, for me, it, it was so powerful because it gave me that confidence that when I did get to the start line in the desert, I knew, right, I can run in this kit. I know I, this kit has been through a marathon before. It's not the question of can I run this? It's right. How well can I do this? How much actually can I enjoy this? And how much can I be aware of my surroundings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see much weirder things in London than someone running around. In, in <laughs> That's and true. Don't worry too much about that. How do you prepare for the <laughs> different environments, like the different heats, the different um, te the surface under feet? Like, how do you prepare for all that? That that was that was a challenge. That was the where my SNC I think was was really key. We, I've got an incredible coach, Jake at the body lab and uh he uh we were doing lots of different things especially sort of impact training sort of i'm not sure the technical word but where we were sort of you know the ankle is a lot about the ankle strength and stability and lots of the little muscles especially lower down the legs so we we're doing a lot of impact work and lots of jumping and is it is it cool sort of plyometric sort of based stuff in, in that sense and uh that that all worked and it, it paid off but the truth is it's very difficult to, to sometimes prepare for the trains because the one in alaska for example was essentially 26.2 miles of ice so it was like running on ice skating rink and that's quite hard to sort of to uh to um recreate you know back home in london so for those things it was a little bit of going into the unknown for sure it's just about doing the best we could to get there but yeah it was still always that unknown was always there nice man and all that prepared you for the the true pinnacle of meeting peter andre as well so that was that was obviously a nice thing to see. <laughs> it was he was a lovely guy actually and he's a very very passionate about dementia um, sadly it's affected his family and uh, we had like a 10 minute conversation after after i went on to his show and he was very very well, just very kind with his time and in his words and uh, i think they're going to support whatever we do next but yeah dementia's impacted his family which is which is really devastating i think his mum mm -hmm. that must be a it's, it's a funny thing to do to to find solace in a bond like that to go well we've both suffered through a similar mm. thing and to kind of find i'm sure it's a sense of like reassurance I, I think so i think i mean i think so often when we're going through hard times whatever they may be and whether that's someone in our family's ill whether it's we're ill ourselves whether we're going through a hard time we're with work with money whatever it is sometimes we it's very easy to think we are the only ones in that position and you know we can become so closed in on it's us and we're looking down and sometimes all it takes is to look up and realize hang on there's other people in that position there's people we maybe can go to for advice people we can go to just to, for a hug or for support or whatever it may be and I think sometimes we can take that little bit of comfort and confidence knowing hang on there's other people affected by this too and we're in this together and that's great just to have it that but that means now we've also got to come together to now to do the other thing and that's to, to find a cure and, and to fight for this but I mean, the greatest thing about one of the greatest things about my career now is all the messages I receive of people who say they've been affected by dementia and the the hope that they've maybe received from seeing some of my challenges. Because again, when you're, you know, I've had lots of really personal messages of people who are who that who have given up careers or they've given up their university studies because they've now got to care for their their parent or for their their grandparent or aunt or uncle, something like that. And again, they're they're so focused on their day-to-day -day because they have to be because they've got to literally care for someone's life that sometimes it's hard for them to remember that there is people out there fighting for this and that's all we need sometimes in life is a little bit of hope and hope is one of my favorite words in in the dictionary because i think it's so so powerful and sometimes when we're going through that dark time whatever it may be all we need to do is is just look up and and there's hope all around us and then maybe we can sometimes find it in other people too absolutely man i think that's a, a wonderful place to to wrap up but I know you're not allowed to share too many details about what's upcoming, but okay. where can people stay tuned and where can people follow you to, to kind of keep aware of what is happening? Oh, that's very kind. So Louis Alexander Explorer on, on Instagram and TikTok. My website is louisalexander.org. And yeah, as, as you can said, I will be announcing my next challenge very, very soon. And it's going to, I can't say exactly what it is, but it is going to be in swimming. So it's time to, to put the running shoes away, bring out those swimming goggles again. And it's uh time to deliver another great adventure with a, a greater impact that's the plan sounds really exciting thank you so much for joining me dude
Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate it.